Okay, the next speaker is someone from whom we can all learn about as we're dealing with technology and humans every day. She's a storyteller, an illustrator, and an author of multiple super popular Hello Ruby children's books about programming and computers. So I'm extremely proud to introduce you to Linda Liukas. My name is Linda, and I am probably the first children's book author in the history of this conference to stage the audience and address it. But in addition to being an author, I'm also an enthusiast-level programmer. I'm a business school dropout. I'm many things. And I think that's the thing that separates us from computers. Computers are binary, they can be one thing or the other, a one or a zero, on or off. But as humans, we contain multitudes. We can be many things at the same time, and that's what makes us special. Like many of you, I fell in love with programming as a tool of self-expression. Initially, I wasn't that excited about the intellectual pleasures or the theoretical uh, beauties. I fell in of love with programming as a raw tool to express myself. I could create an entire universe with only words that I chose the rules, I chose the paradigms, I chose the way things worked. But unfortunately, I didn't see a lot of other women in this world. So nine years ago, me and my best friend, we decided to start a movement to teach young women their first experience in software craftsmanship. Not to give them a degree in computer science, just to make them feel how fun and exciting and colorful engineering could be. Uh, and we based it around Ruby on Rails, just something that you could put together in a weekend and get that sense of excitement. And we made an open source repository uh, of the guides and curriculum of this event. And it started to spread around the world. And today, nine years later, Rails Girls has been organized in over 270 cities around the world. It's a pretty remarkable feat because it's all done by volunteers, grassroots people, Rubyists, and other technologists who want to see a more diverse world of technology. And I have no, uh, like, I 100% believe that that future will be uh, here in a while. So I decided that, hmm, like, how should I then start to spend my time? And I spent a few years working at a technology startup and felt a little bit burned out by all of the speech about scalable problems and, and changing the world. And I figured that where does the most scalable change actually happen in the world? And ladies and gentlemen, it happens when you're six years old. If we really want to change the world, we need to focus on kids, and not only on our own kids, but on other people's kids. That's how the world changes, not in Silicon Valley. And I decided that, okay, I want to make somehow the world of technology that I saw as such a colorful and whimsical and fun experience approachable for a whole new generation of kids. And hmm, how should I do it? Well, maybe I should use tools of storytelling to do this. Because after all, stories are the way we humans have learned things for millennia. We learn about ourselves, about each other, and about the world through stories. Some of the stories I heard as a little girl, they still shaped the way I grew up and, and influenced the choices and decisions I make today. So why not create a narrative and a story around technology education worthy of all of the excitement we in this audience feel around it? And I was learning Ruby at the time, and Every time I would run into something that I quite didn't understand in my uh, computer science books, like what is object-oriented programming or what is garbage collection, I would try to imagine how a six-year-old little girl would explain this concept. And that's how Ruby was born 
initially she was a set of doodles in the, the margins of my books. But then something in my brain switched in a weird way. And you know how there's people who see math as colors? I started to see the world of technology as stories. So I thought, hmm. What if Apple was a character? It would definitely be the snow leopard who's beautiful and likes well-designed things but doesn't want to play with the other kids because they are way too messy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and what if, what if Linux was a character? It would be the book-smart penguin that is ruthlessly efficient but somewhat hard to understand at times. And the, the androids, they would be, there would be a billion of them and they would grow up a little bit too fast and they would be super messy but somewhat friendly and open-hearted and, and there would be the idealistic Firefox and I went to my mom with this idea and she said, that sounds horrible. Are you writing? <laughs> a Soviet propaganda book for the kids. That sounds like the 70s. <laughs> and I said, hmm, no, probably I need something more. So I figured, what if we could introduce kids to the world of programming and computers before the syntax? What if we could introduce the big ideas of computers and coding through play and sensory experiences and crafts? What if we could make something that is very abstract into something that is very tangible and real in the lives of a five-year-old? And I decided that, okay, I'm going to write a storybook, and then I'm going to create a set of activities and exercises that enforce these ideas of, say, how do we explain the concept of a loop for a six-year-old, or how do we explain the concept of decomposing a problem. And that's the genesis and the idea of the first book. And this was in 2014, and I'm from Helsinki, Finland, and I had this idea, and I decided that, okay, I'm going to put this project on Kickstarter to see how people react to it, and I'm going to ask for $10,000 in order to self-publish this book, and probably I've met enough parents throughout my travels around the world that this is going to fly. And the project ended up gathering $380,000 worth of pre-orders from all around the world, from Amman to Australia, from Belo Horizonte to Berlin. And I turned into a children's book author overnight. This was uh, when I had no book in my hands. I had no idea what I was doing. I just had an idea. And this almost $400,000, it also represented 20% of the annual book exports of the entire country of Finland. <laughs> Which, <laughs> which speaks volumes of how much we need these things. Because my audience, it wasn't only the programmer moms and dads I was initially thinking about. It was everyone. Everyone is hungry and everyone is ready to learn about this industry of ours. So today, Hello Ruby has been translated into 23 different languages, and it's not only a book about coding or computational thinking, it's actually, actually a series of books from how computers work to how the internet works, how to what is artificial intelligence that tries to, in a gentle and whimsical fashion, to tell the story of a world that is turning more and more towards technology. And the way I see my uh, work is that where I'm trying to prepare kids for a world where every single problem is a computer problem, but those problems are not going to be solved with only the engineering brains we have today. In order to solve more hairy, more uh, fuzzy, more complicated problems, we need different kinds of brains. We need multitudes of people, and we need different kinds of backgrounds. So during this presentation, I wanted to give you kind of a few thoughts to guide you in your own work and maybe help you rekindle or re-inspire your own relationship with computer science. I'm lucky because I get to work with the kids and um, interact with them on a daily basis, but sometimes it's very easy to forget why all of us fell in love with computer science in the first place. And I think part of the reason is that Computer scientists have made it hard. <laughs> They've built layers of abstraction between the man and the machine to the point where we have our fancy uh, tablets and our fancy phones and computers, but we don't have any idea how they work anymore. And I'm a little bit jealous to the people who grew up in the 70s because you could actually touch a transistor. That's so cool. For my generation, on the pinpoint of a pen, there's 300 million transistors, and we don't have any idea how these whole computers came to be. They are like black boxes for us. 
And sometimes I wish that I could shrink myself to the size of a silicon chip and actually walk inside of a computer and see how it works. But unfortunately, that's not possible unless you're a children's book author. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did with Ruby. One day Ruby was really bored and she goes into dad's office and she knows she's not supposed to use dad's computer, but she does anyway, but the computer doesn't work. And the white mouse, it wakes up and says, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor, can you help me out? And Ruby says, of course, I'm the best programmer, uh, computer debugger I know of. And together they crawl inside of the machine and fall deep, deep inside. And first, they meet the electricity layer, the tiny bits that only know how to go on and off, on and off. And Ruby and Mouse realize that these guys are not going to be much help for us. We're going to have to climb higher. And they meet the logic gates that ask really funny puzzles from them, like, am I not green, true or false? And they need to solve these puzzles in order to move ahead. They meet the hardware layer of the computer, the CPU that is really good at bossing everyone else around, but really forgetful, so it needs the help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive and the other components. They briefly visit the operating system, and the Snow Leopard hasn't seen the cursor either, and, and they need to debug their way through. And finally, I'll spoil you a little bit, they do find the cursor. But I think even more importantly, get the, they get this very tangible, real narrative of how a computer is an abstraction machine. Because the computers we see today, they are digital, but a computer could also be theoretical, a computer could also be biological. And I think having a robust understanding and an experience of what a computer is, is going to help these kids go forward. One of the exercises I like to do with kids is this one. I give them a piece of paper and I ask them to draw what is inside of a computer. And usually the kids at this point, they make one very different separation from adults or different thing they do. Adults, if I give them this same exercise, they say, I have no idea. I don't have a PhD in computer science. I, I can't make a guess. But the kids, they think for a while and even the five or six year olds, they start with a hypothesis. They draw something out. And surprisingly, Many of the aspects the kids present to me, they, they have an inkling of truth in them because a computer can take a thousand forms and be a thousand um, different um, looks. So some of the kids, they imagine that inside a computer there's files and apps. They see the con uh, computers as containers of content and that's to some extent right, yeah. That's something computers do. Some kids see computers as these abstract network components. Uh, that's also something a computer is. They maybe have like an architectural engineer's idea of what a computer is. Some kids explain computers through narratives. They uh, draw out these elaborate stories of the computer as a stage. These are my favorite kids because this is what I do also. And they are right. This is how you can explain what happens inside a computer too. My personal other favorites are the kids who have this very steampunkish idea about computers. They think that there's little gears, tiny gears inside of a computer that turn, and they might not be right, but there is something a little bit mechanical or digital in this case inside of a computer that they do grasp. And then finally, my favorite kids, the ones who realize that a computer is not based on magic, it's based on logic. They draw transistors, they draw electricity, they draw different kinds of components, and they try to make sense of something that even us adults with histories and degrees in computer science sometimes have a hard time explaining. The next exercise we do is we build a paper computer. And I do this exercise with kids around five or six years old. And if you're curious about this on helloruby.com, you can find this for free. So they assemble their computer and they cut out the different components. Uh, they get to know the operating system. It's unbelievable how popular Apple is, but also Linux is so cute. A lot of kids <laughs> choose it. Uh, they look at the files inside of their computers and then they start to create apps on their tiny little computers. And these are kind of fascinating. Uh, one kid made an app that could print out Lego coloring pages, because that's the best thing a six-year-old can imagine in the world. 
But this six-year-old, he could imagine a little bit more. He figured that, hmm, why coloring pages? Why not real Legos? Why couldn't my paper computer print out real Legos? And then he got completely excited and he was like, what if I print out toothbrushes for my whole family and breakfast for the entire family next day? And his mom goes, Arthur, that's not possible. But the thing is, it is possible. Odds are that Arthur's generation are going to 3D print their Saturday candy. And I think giving kids these kinds of spaces for imagination is what we should be doing as adults. But my very favorite story is this little boy who I met who was, had built his paper computer and he was completely immersed in it. He had these huge headphones on because you see, he had built his very own intergalactic planetary navigation application. And the boy's father was on the opposite side of the room, but really he was far away in the Martian orbit. He was an astronaut. And the boy's big responsibility was to bring dad safely back home on Earth. And I think kids who grow up with having this kind of an experience with technology are going to have a radically different kind of a worldview to those who grow up watching YouTube or browsing Facebook. The challenge is computers don't look like they used to look like. I think our generation is going to be the last generation that remembers the computer as a glowing box, remembers a computer based on its screen. In the future, like we heard in the first keynote, computers are going to be embedded everywhere around us. And nowhere else is this as clear as when I'm working with kids. So I show kids these four pictures. I show them a picture of a car. I show them a picture of a grocery store, a toilet, and a dog. And I ask the five to nine-year-olds, which one of these do you think is a computer? And the kids who we usually think are so out of the box thinkers, so creative in what they do, they all cross their hands and they go, Linda, are you completely bonkers? None of those is a computer. Computer is the thing which in front of mom or dad spends way too much time. But we talk, and we decide that actually a car is a computer because a car has a navigation system and how many other things. I can't wait to hear the other talks because I think I'm going to learn other ways computers, cars are computers. Uh, grocery stores are computers because there's the ice cream box that keeps the ice cream cold. Uh, there's the burglar alarms, those are computers. There's the teller's machine, that's a computer. Dogs, they might not be computers, but a dog's collar, it might have a computer inside of it, and that's really cool if the dog is prone to running away. And also, uh, dogs, like a lot of kids nowadays, they bring up robot dogs. You get actually into a really interesting ethical discussion with kids when you try to define what is the difference between a living and a computer thing. And then, I don't suggest you do this with, if you have kids under the age nine, but I tell kids that in Japan, toilets are computers, and there's even hackers who hack them. And <laughs> this is the end of discussion uh, for the rest of the time being. Nothing else can get done after this proclamation. We actually figure out that there's hundreds of computers in every single home, not only the one or two dad or mom is spending too much time on, because your doorbell is a computer, and your microwave is a computer, and your remote control is a computer. And the next step in this exercise is one where I give kids a tiny sticker. And it's an on-off sticker, uh, a sticker with an on-off button on it. And I give them these everyday items like uh, a tuna can or a pair of keys or sneakers. And I tell them that, you know what? For this afternoon alone, you have this magical ability to make anything in this room into a computer by putting this sticker on it. And again, the kids object. They say, Linda. I don't know the right answer for this question. And Linda, this is too difficult. And I tell them, ha ha, you know what? Neither does your parent. They might have heard about the thing called the IoT or the Internet of Things, but it's kind of your generation that is going to decide what that future looks like. And then this little girl comes to me and she has chosen a bicycle lamp. And she tells me, Linda, if this bicycle lamp were a computer, I could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent, and this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. 
And that's the moment I'm looking for. Not the moment when the kid understands if-else statements in JavaScript or the difference between hashes and arrays in Ruby. The moment when they understand three very profound things that even as adults have a hard time understanding. First of them is that the world is not ready yet. There's so much we haven't invented yet, including the bicycle lamp movie projector. Uh, that isn't probably the most important thing on the list, but still, that doesn't exist. The second thing is that technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit ready and a little bit better, because it scales and it creates wealth around it, and that's the way humankind has always progressed. And the third thing the little girl realized was that she herself could be a part of that change. Odds are that she's not going to be the next Steve Wozniak or the hardware hacker of the future, but for a moment there, she had the self-belief and self-efficacy to think that, oh, I could be the world's very first bicycle lamp movie projector innovator. And I think that's what we ought to be preserving in childhood, but then also a little bit in our own adult selves. So how do you explain what a computer is then, if a computer can take a thousand forms and have a thousand faces? Well, I think in order to understand that, we need to go all the way back to the year 1945, when John von Neumann came up with this famous computer architecture. And for many of you in this class, this is a very familiar chart, but for many of you, it isn't. Let me explain in a very simplified manner. So what von Neumann suggested is that a computer is any device that takes in data, it processes the data somehow, and then out comes the modified data. And the thing that makes a computer so special is that it has stored memory. It stores the data that comes in and the data that comes out, but then it also has the program, the instructions to what to do with that data. And that's why computers are special, because a pinball machine can only be a pinball machine, a tractor can only be a tractor, but a computer can be anything based on the instructions you give for it. And understanding the input-output really helps us understand the world. So when you go on Facebook and you like something, in goes the data to Facebook server to add one more like count, out comes the updated like count. If you sit in a car and forget to buckle up, in goes the data that someone is sitting here, out comes the beep, 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 annoying sound we all hate so much. And I think the thing that really helps us in the input-output model is the fact that it's there for the future. Uh, when laymen, when people who are not indoctrinated in this world of technology, when they hear words like blockchain, artificial intelligence, algorithms, they panic. And they forgot to realize that actually a computer only processes data. It takes, for instance, the coordinates of a car and has a process of mapping them, and then out comes um, the instructions for a self-driving car to get around. It's nothing more peculiar than that. And thinking about, whoops, and so input, output. But what happens with the data then? I think this is one of the most interesting questions we have going on around right now, and I think the first keynote also touched upon this. We have so much more data than we used to have due to sensors, due to internet, due to our activities we do online. But this also somehow gets muddled up in a really confusing way. So in order to try to make sense of all of this data around us, I have this exercise with kids that is called the data selfie. And it starts like this. I give kids a sheet, a working sheet, and I ask them to log five things they've searched online. I ask them to um, list four things they've liked or given thumbs up to, three videos they've watched, two places they've been with their phone, and one person they've messaged with. And they come up with a list. And then they swap the list with one another, and they try to come up with an image of the person they see. So what would a little boy, uh, or not a little boy, what would a person who has Googled for turtles and um, turkey, who has visited school and, and library, who has liked Beyonce videos and uh, talked with mom, what would they look like? And they call, all come up with this selfie, and then we have a discussion about, did you know that this kind of data is being tracked for, uh, about you, and, and so forth. And the next step of this exercise is I take the daily, and I block out a few pictures, I block out a few titles, and I block out a few pictures, and I ask them to reimagine the front page uh, so that it would make the six-year-old, turtle-loving little boy click it out. 
And then we get to have really interesting discussions about what it means to personalize content for us and how computers define uh, the things that we see online. And I was showing this exercise to my mom, who's like 60 years old, and she was like, oh, wow, that's why Facebook knows that I was watching that exact dress on Zalando earlier this week. It knows how to show me that ad. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's not magic. It's actually an algorithm. And I think this is the big responsibility we have as the computer scientist and the, the engineering industry, because we've built black boxes that have taken the user away from these problems, that have made computers easier, more accessible, uh, faster, but they've made them also more foreign and lessened the agency um, the older and the younger and the non-so-technical people have over their devices. I think. We talk a lot about teaching kids coding, and it's cool and it's great, but if coding is only taught as grammar classes, not as poetry, we're not going to get any far. And what I mean with that is the idea that in the same way as we learn English, not only by studying the grammar of English, which is horrible, we learn English by actually speaking it out. We learn English by reading different kinds of books. We learn English by writing essays. We ought to be teaching technology in a much more diverse way for all kinds of learners, not only coding, but also the thinking, uh, the, the ideas and ideals around computers. And one of the most interesting research topics I've found around this is the concept of a notional machine. The idea that maybe instead of only learning to code or program, kids should get a really robust sense of what a computer is good at and what a human is good at. And that requires us to ask, as an industry, questions that we haven't asked in the past so much, like, is computer the same thing as technology? Can computers be creative? One of my favorite exercises around this concept of notional machine is an exercise where I give each kid their own algorithm. And for non-programmer parents, the word algorithm sounds scary. They think of finance and they think of Facebook. But for kids, algorithm is a wonderful word. First of all, it seems very adult, and second of all, it feels big in your mouth. And third of all, they know that an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step sequence to solving a problem. So one kid's algorithm might be to draw a blue circle, another kid's algorithm might be to make a red dot inside of each blue circle, a third kid's algorithm might be to connect the red dots with a blue, um, blue line. And each kid with equipped with their own algorithm, goes around this beautiful big piece of paper. And I turn this art machine on, and the kids start to go around and around this big piece of paper. And in roughly 20 minutes, we've created this beautiful piece of work. And we all stand up, and we observe what we made. And I ask the kids, so how long do you think it would take a computer to generate an artwork like this? And the kids, they look at each other and they calculate and they're like, hmm, there's 12 of us and it took us 20 minutes, so I think it would take the computer over an hour at least to make this. And I tell them, you know what, a computer could probably generate tens of millions of these in a nanosecond, because this is exactly the kind of task a computer is good at. It's good at repeating sequences of instructions over and over again, faster than any human mind could do. But how does this artwork make you feel? And a little girl, she raises her hand and says, it makes me feel very busy. <laughs> and another one says, oh, it makes me think of last summer. And I say, ha ha. So this is the thing a computer can't yet do. It can't experience its own emotions around artwork. It can never offer an interpretation of an artwork based on its own memories. And maybe these are the kinds of things that us humans will be much better at for a while longer. And Sometimes when you get into these discussions with kids, you get some really peculiar answers. I was in London earlier this year, and a little boy comes to me and says, Linda, what kind of a profession should I have? Because computers are taking our wo work from us. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> heavy dinner discussion in <laughs> these little ones home. But it begs us to ask these questions, especially as we are at the bleeding edge of this industry. I used to say that computers are not good at creativity. And I'm taking that back because computers are starting to have a perception of the world. If they can recognize cats from YouTube videos, it's starting to look like perception. And I think perception is the first step to having an imagination. But I think 
creativity is still something that separates the two of us. Curiosity, like how do you program a computer to be curious? How do you give it an identity and a worldview? These are questions that are so radically important to be discussed in larger groups of um, practitioners. I think every company will be a technology company, and that's also why we are all here and why we have such a variety of different kinds of companies, from car manufacturers to, to retailers present here. But I think it's not a very exciting world unless we have more diversity in the people who are building it. And oftentimes we think about technology uh, companies as sort of operational, as um, mechanical as somehow boring and lonely, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens when creative companies, non-technology companies, start to embrace this world. So, one of the most well-known companies in Finland is called Marimekko. It's the clothes company that makes those crazy patterns, and, and it was founded by a very radical woman in the 70s who said that she could have equally well have done a fun fair or, um, or, or like a flower shop, but she chose as her medium of expression uh, clothes. And it begs me to think that, ha, huh, like what if Armi Ratia, the founder of Marimekka, had been a programmer? What if she had had the tools to express herself through the language we all love? in the 70s. And I got to do a little experiment on this a few weeks ago. So I took 1,400 Marimekka product names. Uh, they are really iconic product names with like Unikko and Joka Mies pa Paita and Tasaraita and very sort of this Karelian robust vibes. And I fed them into a recurrent neural network, a library, um, and I let the computer work for a few hours. The first rounds, where the computer took in all of that data and it tried to start to spot patterns in the data, uh, were really bad. The computer came up with the worst names ever, and they sounded a little bit Estonian. Not, no offense to Estonians, but they, like, no, no, not good at all. But the computer kept learning and learning and learning, and then the next morning I woke up at like 4 a.m. It felt like I had a Tamagotchi again or Christmas or something happening. I went to see what has the computer created for me. And the names were really awesome. There were things like Pyninpakka, Putti, Tanohalti, Tirkka, Ruitintulla. It's important to notice here that none of these words is actually Finnish. But for non-Finns and Finns alike, these sound very Finnish. They sound joyful. They sound Karelian. They sound very Marimekka. And I went to show these to the creative department of Marimekka and said, what do you think about these? And initially they were like really skeptical because of course creativity is at the core of Marimekka. Naming products is something that they are really proud about. But they said that, wow, these are actually quite good. How long did you say that it took you to make this up? <laughs> And I think this is the future when all kinds of companies, ranging from manufacturing to publishing to retail to education, start to embrace computers as our peers, as something that does certain kinds of things better than we do ourselves and can help us be more human. After all, that's something that computers are really good at doing. The title of my language is 100, 100 languages, and it's not a sort of segue into programming languages, it's actually a poem. Uh, it's a poem uh, by a small Italian village that decided to revolutionize education in the 1950s. So basically what had happened was that after the Second World War, they realized that, oh wow, we've messed up a whole generation of kids with fascism and, and all of this stuff, and we need to rethink the way we educate our kids. And the town is called Reggio Emilia, and instead of writing a vision plan, instead of writing a strategy, they wrote a poem. And the poem says that a child has a hundred languages. The child has the language of reading, the child has a language of writing, the child has the language of drawing and uh, sculpting and playing and singing. But we adults take away 99% of those languages. We say that the way to learn about the world is through reading and writing, and we take away the rest of the languages. And I think if Loris Malaguzzi had lived today, he would have definitely said that programming and coding and tinkering are ways of expressing the world. 
And the sad thing is, computer science wasn't always like this, and the world wasn't always like this, because the reason we are all here today is because of this industry is based on multidisciplinary, uh, wonderful, creative people. Think about Claude Shannon, who had very fascinating interests around the world. He loved juggling, and he loved um, this very esoteric uh, English philosophy uh, called, uh, like, created by George Boole. And he happened in his undergrad class to take a lesson on Boole and algebra. And then he went to MIT later on and studied rigorous mathematics and electricity. And then somewhere in his brain, he made the connection that, oh, wow, actually, the way this uh, Boolean logic gates and this electricity map up, it's the same. And that's why we have the transistors, that's why we have the industries we have today, because of Shannon's interest and curiosity about the world. And if we go even further back and we think about the world's first programmer, Miss Ada Lovelace, who was a Victorian era woman, a daughter of the poet Lord Byron, uh, and a mathematical mom. And Byron was like a womanizing man. He had a lot of affairs and uh, like all sorts of funny business. And, and Ada's mom was really pissed at him and said that my daughter is going to have a rigorous mathematical education. None of that poetry nonsense for her. And Ada did get a rigorous mathematical education for her era of a woman. But she also retained a little bit of her father's worldview and imaginative play. And when Charles Babbage and those guys were building the analytical engine in London, Ada was the first person to realize that with numbers you can represent logic, and with logic you can represent anything in the world. And that's why we think that she is the world's first programmer. I think technology is built on humanity. And often we have this very binary idea about the world, that there's us and there's them. For this audience, the us is the people who embrace technology, and them are the people who are sort of the slow cogs in the wheel, who don't understand all of the potential and, and colorfulness and excitedness of, of technology. But for the other side, uh, it's us who can only consume technology and those who create it. But really, it's interlinked because the world's first pro uh, computers were actually humans. Computing used to be a profession, being a computer. Uh, at a time when we had no calculators, you would count square roots of two or powers of ten uh, on these long sheets of paper. And in some ways, I think the very last computers in the world will be humans too. The word technology, it comes from Greek, and I think it pays notice to thinking that today we think computers are technology, but in the past, combustion engines were technology. In the past, uh, bicycles were technology. And we don't know what the technology of the future will look like. But we do know the Greek origin of this world and its pros, tools to solve problems. But it's not only the tools to solve problems, it's also the skills and attitudes uh, that the people and the humans bring into the problem-solving equation. And this we tend to forget, because we have this binary world where you need to be either or, not and. But luckily the kids don't remember. Uh, kids do remember. So I surveyed um, a few uh, nine-year-old kids in Helsinki in the English school, and I asked them to explain to me what is technology, who uses technology, and what is it used for. And this little girl, nine years old, comes to me and says, technology is electricity that loves. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> appreciate that for a moment. Is there a more poetic, beautiful way of saying this? Technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, people uses technology. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Linda. I think you took away the last language I had. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions for Linda? We have time for a couple. So, the people working with the microphones. Yes. 
Hello. Hi. Yes. Good morning. Hi. Um, so I read this Microsoft-funded um, study that, that, that found out, or actually confirmed, that your kids uh, from six to nine, they are very excitable about technology science and um, computer science. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're boy, uh, boys or girls, mm. but, but um, girls tend, well, this excitement drops off in teenage years, in late yeah. teenage years, especially for, especially for girls. Yeah. And the, uh, when they asked why, they, the answer they got was that it wasn't taught in a, in a, in a language for girls. Yeah. And I'm dead myself, and this, this answer, this, uh, it really worries me because I don't understand it. I don't get this answer. I don't know what, what, what it means to teach technology in, in a different language mm. than it is being taught. So what do you make of this answer? Yeah. So I, I have two ideas for this. First of them is that I absolutely agree with you. There is something weird that happens between the ages of 10 to 12 to girls where they start to define them into identities in a very strict fashion where they are like, I'm into arts, I can't be into math. I'm into sciences, I can't be into creative stuff. And that's why I think we need to catch them young, uh, to sort of postpone that identity formation uh, as long as we can, because it's a natural part of growing up, obviously, like defining yourself, but sometimes we are too strict in that. Uh, the question about how to teach uh, kids, I'm not certain that it's only about gender. I think there's a lot of little boys who would learn best by moving their bodies, like how, how can we cater programming and computation for them also? Or there's girls who learn not through puzzles and logic um, exercises, but who would learn better by crafting and, and experimenting uh, around computing. Uh, I think it's this industry's responsibility. We didn't know how important technology would be when in the 60s and the 70s we started to form uh, these like technology education curriculum and it's important now to sort of reflect back and uh, speak also with the pedagogy community because they have a lot of answers we as the computer science and engineering people lack. Then the second part of the exercise, uh, exercise the question, is kind of around girls and boys. Um, I shy away a little bit in, in sort of... Um, like dividing the world based on gender alone. And when I write the books, oftentimes people come to say to me that, oh, that's so cool that you're doing this for the girls. But I'm not actually doing it for the girls. I'm trying to remember myself what I was like when I was six and what got me excited, what made my socks roll in my <laughs> like, uh, feed in the morning, and projecting that world because it's, it's sorely lacking at the moment in the way we teach computing. But I think even more important is actually the perception little boys have around computing. So when I work in Japan, one of the most proud moments for me is in a culture that is not necessarily as equal as Nordic countries where I come from are, that little boys come to me and since we don't share a language, I show them the different characters from Ruby books and I ask them, who is your favorite? And there's a little boy character called Django who has a pet python and I always think that, oh, that's the one they are going to choose. But they choose Ruby. And I feel that's such a powerful moment when you realize that these little boys think that a girl can be their role model when it's come to computing and education. And they grow up looking at Star Wars, girl Jedi Knights, and they see this world changing for women also. Or they don't even need see it changing, they just feel that it's okay. And that's, I think, a more radical idea than only the idea that how do we make um, this accessible for women, which is also important. Right, thank you. Here's another one. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, computers don't have curiosity so far. But what about that uh, web spider thing that basically is possessed with an idea that every link is very interesting and as soon as it obeys the rules defined in robots.txt, he has to visit all of them. Yeah. So th that's actually like curiosity, it. the refined one. Yeah. I, uh, I as, as, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the question is, how do you think probably computers are already pretty good at creating things, at generating things, but as you mentioned, that the list of names for Marimekko, you have actually brought this list in front of actual people to filter out mm. the, real, uh, the really successful ones. Computers cannot define that no. kind of thing. No. So yeah. probably that is the thing that 
we humans still like yeah. curation. Hold, just, uh, hold, hold some. Yeah, I love some that. Some priority over. I love that example of a spider. I think these are questions that like I definitely don't have answers for. I think all of the discussion we have around AI is um, muffled by this this fear we and especially the non-technical community has around it. And I would give the example of the, uh, the Facebook AI that like, went rogue and started uh, creating its own language, and people were so scared in sort of my circles. And then I was trying to explain to them that, no, no, like the programmer forget to put the parameter of like, do this work in English, and that's why it went off rails. It wasn't that the AI was smart, it was that the programmer was stupid, and, or like forgetful, <laughs> like we all are. And I think that's the question about the curiosity, and, and um, like how do we give these very human abilities to a computer um, that guide us. Like we, the curiosity is one thing that feeds us and keeps us going, but what if it turns into a destructive thing, like the spider example? Uh, that's, that's like a bad side of curiosity if it just keeps clawing its way through things. Is it, is it, is it bad on its own? Curiosity, definitely. No, I mean the spider thing. Huh. Good ethical question. Let's think about it after. <laughs> is curiosity a bad thing in human life? Precisely. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Linda.